Good morning, Conquest of Doers. It's uh, Monday morning, 10 o'clock, here in Hallensalsen, Sweden. And um, I've spent the weekend going over some Web3 uh, distributed web stuff, um, which uh, I've done a few blogs on. Um, it's tying in with the Conquest of Doe in terms of uh, the idea of um, natural resources and grains or access to food etc um, and the knowledge of making food and growing food uh, being greatly more important than um, the ideology of money. Um, money is a kind of an ideology. Um, uh, Bakunin called it the metaphysics of uh, wealth. Uh, but uh, that aside, um, last year I got into reading and studying something called the Brandt Report, which was uh, published in the late 70s. And one of the researchers on that report, uh, as a much younger man, uh, was James Quilligan. Um, and he updated the Brandt Report um, some years later, about 20 years later, I think it was, maybe even 30. And um, uh, effectively looked at what the Brandt Report was uh, looking at doing, which was really trying to create a financial space in which the less developed southern hemisphere uh, would not be handicapped by the priorities set by the financial system dominated from the northern hemisphere, particularly the um, Anglo-American access. Uh, from the 70s onwards, the ever strengthening Deutschmark, um, the current Deutschmark within the Euro tension is quite interesting on that question. Um, now, the idea of finance as a commons is something that James Quilligan uh, tackled in a series of seminars, which I linked to in a blog that I did earlier. And um, I haven't been able to find a video of James Quilligan, in fact I haven't done a search, I, I will do that once I finish this uh, video, but what I wanted to do was read this um, from the Peace P Foundation on their wiki, um, which has uh, a transcript of a lecture given by James Quilligan, Quilligan on finance as a common. So I'm going to read that now and then I'm going to post this and then I'll go off and look for some more links um, and in the description to this video I will also um, add in links to uh, my other blogs dealing with um, the Brandt report uh, and also reports on um, from, from 2009 around that time on uh, special drawing rights alternatives to the dollar reserve system um, which is really something we're going through now. Um, this then all plugs back into the uh, political economy and political philosophy aspects of uh, blockchain technology and um, uh, what's generically known as Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, the infrastructure of that is a commons as I see it, which is rather much wider and Web3 really does get at that, showing how a distributed computer system can do um, a job much more robustly than that job currently carried out by trusted, centralised, large servers. Um, and uh, getting away from the hardware and getting away from the ownership, but looking at the function of that system and looking at it in a systems-oriented um, uh, non-ideological way, um, how do you deliver the services and distribute the goods and services that are generated out of, um, even a free market economy um, can be looked as a commons because the free market economy exists within a um, society or within communities and as such um, if we're relying on the functions of a free market um, or some sort of 
commerce, commerce or commercial structures to uh, efficiently deal with the questions or problems of distribution and production. Um, and you know, that's what it really boils down to. And, and the sharing of the work involved in distribution and production. Um, that, that's a commons. Um, now, this then gets back into uh, you know, the whole idea of um, you know, who owns the world or who has the right to be the pencil monitor, really. Um, and uh, um, there are authoritarian models and there are voluntary models um, and there is centralization of authoritarian hierarchical models and there are decentralized um, non-hierarchical voluntary non-coercive models those are the two polar polarities I consider that we're presently steaming full steam ahead into the authoritative polarity um, and uh, for me that gives up too much what, of what I would term liberty and um, we need to be turning this ship around and heading back in the other direction to get back to something with more balance and um, as with everything balance and well, moderation a little of what you fancy does you good um, do us to others as you'd have done to yourself and all of these sort of you know folk wisdom type sayings um, all have rather a lot in them in terms of uh, uh, achieving happiness um, as opposed to success um, there's an old sort of uh, oh, what's the, um, aphorism um, and it goes, uh, success is getting what you want and happiness is wanting what you get. Uh, and that kind of sums up, uh, well for me at any rate, in that aphorism, uh, the two polarities of this uh, authority and totalitarianism on one hand, um, or the uh, determinism camp, and on the other hand, the other uh, polarity you have, free will and the um, liberty camp and um, I argue for horses for courses you know? um, and uh, uh, by putting boundaries around each instance that we decide to do as a community, a society, as a group, as, you know, um, as a family, uh, the boundaries also have to be time limited uh, for a um, review process uh, and uh, the withdrawal of consent uh, which can come at any point if uh, there is a known problem, a failure or in any event the, uh, the task is completed or we don't want to do it anymore. Um, now, all of these ideas, these decision-making things, these boundaries and all the rest of it are ideally suited to blockchain, what they call smart contracts. Um, and so uh, that's why Web3, blockchain technology and uh, DAOs, um, that is uh, digital or distributed uh, autonomous organisations, uh, are I think such a compelling um, tool for uh, social commons, commercial commons, commercial markets and social markets, call it what you will, uh, but also nested within that, uh, the creating the uh, rain checks or the tokens for entry. Um, within those boundary or bounded instances or uh, you hear them uh, referred to often as use cases. Um, anyway, I've probably gone on a, a bit long with that introduction but I think it provides the sort of context for how I personally am reading 
uh, this excellent lecture which I'm going to just um, read the transcript of now from James Quillogan. So first of all, by way of introduction, um, hold on, let's see what happens if I click on this link. Um, it says the link is broken, which is probably an open link in the tab. I'm mining on this machine, uh, Ethereum, at the same time as I'm doing this. In fact, what I might do is just, uh, I've only got two cards on this. This is only giving me 9.6 mega hash. Um, but let's just close that for now. My main miner is working on uh, my, my other machine. So I'll close that terminal and see if this will actually, actually that might help us a bit. Right then, um, yeah, that's gone. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to do this anyway, um, and then I will um, see if I can get that uh, old YouTube video out of the Wayback Machine. Um, but here we go. Right, as ecological economists have been saying for some time, the modern economy needs to be reconceived as a subsystem of the biospheric commons. For the present economic system to internalise its negative externalities and come into scale with the global commons, it will need to adjust the exchange flows and consumption production income across political territorial boundaries to the natural resource thresholds, inflows of raw materials and energy and outflows of waste of the planet's own boundaries. This seminar addresses how the global commons, material, solar, natural, genetic, social, cultural, intellectual and digital, uh, can be aggregated into a new kind of metric. This wide range of commons assets would constitute a unique index which is based not on productivity, profit or interest, but on perpetual vitality and continuous adaptation of local resources to support a good quality of life for all human beings and life systems. Under this new monetary system, private industry flourishes from the surplus resources which are rented from the Commons Trusts. The socially marginalised and vulnerable receive a subsistence income from the state and the primary assets of the Commons are preserved and regenerated. The long-term security of the Commons thus provides full backing for an interest-free system of mutual credit through which the credits and debits of each currency user are instantly adjusted and cleared. Under new constitutional agreements, businesses and governments would agree to use this interest-free credit currency in payment for all transactions, taxes and fees. This would reorient the focus of the private sector away from devaluing commons resources as unaccountable external costs, encouraging businesses to adopt a framework of property management and value that reflects a more accurate measure of the actual costs of resource production. Under this commons reserve system, business would continue to create profits and positive externalities through innovation, competitive products and services, and the adjustment of the market to the actual value of resources. But long-term wealth now arises not through consumer demand, investment or capital accumulation, but in the enhancement of carrying capacity of the global commons to support life and life systems for present and future generations. Instead of presenting a handicap, the commons reserve system will provide businesses with what they are presently seeking long-term signals and incentives that arise through ecological energy and exchange rate stability. Um, there's a link to this uh, debate graph stream. Um, it will be in the description. Uh, it was also on uh, the blog which I did this morning. If you just uh, go to here, this blog, Free Software, The Commons, Free Money and Liberty, The Tyranny, Tyranny of the Geek. Web 3 um, and uh, this here is a screen capture uh, and you can register on this debate graph and you get access to all of these notes 
from the seminar. Uh, so let's just go back to here. Right then, now this is the transcript from the video, so I'm going to just read it um, and uh, see how we go with that. So, to begin, I offer a little guide to this journey. I'd like to take you on tonight so that you know where we're going and why. Some people have called finance itself a commons, but this is very far from realised. For finance to truly become a commons, a great deal of preliminary work is needed. My talk this evening is about the reasons why finance will not be seen as a commons unless major co changes take place beyond the financial world. But these are the very changes which finance can help create. This will all become clearer as we go along, and that's the fire that I'd like to light under you this evening. So first, we'll speak in monetary terms. Then we'll talk about the meaning of commons and envision a commons-based society. Finally, we'll talk about the supportive role of finance in a commons society and how finance can become part of the commons, including the creation of commons wealth funds. Let me begin by asking, is it realistic to believe that we are going to achieve sustainability through green taxes or sustainable investment through the private sector? Or, more pertinently, is it truly possible to create sustainability through a determined and long reduction in government budgets and public spending? Consider what is preventing sustainability. The immediate causes are evident. Boom and bust cycles, short-term thinking, compulsory growth, concentration of wealth and devaluation of social capital. OK. But what is the longer term cause? It's interest rates. Most of us in the financial sector recognise the interest rate as an outside variable over which we have no control. Most proposals for stabilising currency value reformulate the political or regulatory context in which interest rates are generated. But they do not retool the mechanism of the interest rate itself which is at the core of the system of money. Meanwhile, as we all sit back and theorise, interest rates continue to amass deficits and debt. As ecological economists have been saying for many decades, interest rates represent a much faster algorithm for productive growth than the capacity of the planet to regenerate or replenish its own resources. A debt-free global reserve asset will require a completely different approach. We have to begin to understand the field of economics as a subsystem of society and we also need to see society as a subsystem of the biosphere. Each of these levels, economics, society and nature, includes and transcends the one before it. The economy exists because society has provided it with infrastructure. Any society exists because, the bias, because it has the biosphere to sustain it. Hence the economy, society and nature form a nested hierarchy or holarchy. But during the past several centuries, as Carl Pogliani pointed out, the economy has been disembedded from society and nature. Another way to say this is that the economy has attempted to embed society and nature inside itself. Today the market thinks that society and nature serves it, rather than recognising that the economy is meant to serve society and nature. This present economic system is based on the truism that we consume what we need. Okay. So why has the economics of human need failed us? By focusing on consumption, economics has neglected the rest of the natural cycle. We consume what we need, but this also means that we consume to be replenished. Yes, as individuals we are replenishing ourselves through consumption, but individual consumption is not replenishing society. 
and individual consumption is clearly not replenishing nature. Business has adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by selling private goods to individual consumers. Government has adopted the idea that it is meeting human needs by regulating and provisioning public goods to individual citizens. But who is responsible for preserving our common goods? Who is responsible for replenishing what is consumed? Who is creating collective intentions for sustainability? The economics of human need must be broadened to encompass the commons. Our commons are the collective heritage of humanity, the shared resources of nature and society that we inherit, create and use. We all depend upon those commons natural, genetic, material, intellectual, digital, social and cultural for our survival and well-being. We create the commons through group intentions for sustainability. The commons is the economics of replenishment. How do we embark on this economics of replenishment? To internalise its negative externalities and come into scale with the global commons, the economy, will need to be redesigned as a subsistence of the biosphere, not simply as a metaphor or ideal, but as a structured principle. I'm just going to stop there, um, because I know I've got a document open on the screen here, it's something I was reading yesterday, and I just want to read something uh, from that. Uh, actually, there we go. Um, I'll reopen it here. It's this. Uh, uh, where are we now? Um, there we are. It's this paper here. Now, where are we? It's uh, a paper. Um, from 2008 um, and it's uh, from man is the measure of all things to money is the measure of all things and what it does here uh, at this day I've had it opened um, here we are uh, Protagoras and African philosophy um, now Protagoras was a famous sophist philosopher according to Plato and Aristotle um, who coined the phrase way back when uh, man is the measure of all things, and this paper is about that. Uh, but this African philosophy thing is quite pertinent to what I was just reading there. So um, let's just read a bit of this and then get to this phrase, and then I'll go to this footnote to tell you what this means. Each of the three identified strands of Protagoras thought find an echo in authentic indigenous African thought. One prominent point of their convergence is on humanism. The humanistic leitmotif is Protagoras thought is succinctly captured in his thesis that the human being is the measure of all things. A number of African thinkers, and we think correctly, have identified humanism as a foundational principle in indigenous African social and political thought and practice. It is evinced in Akan uh, thought, for instance, by the guidance that the following maxim provides in formal political and legal deliberations. Anipa na ahaya, Mefresika sika nigia so mefri matoma natoma nergiso omipa na ohid. So if we just go down and um, there's a convenient translation for us in the footnote uh, at footnote 39 here uh, and literally it is the human being that counts. When I call on money, when I am in need, money does not respond. When I call on my clothes, my clothes do not respond. So, it is the human being that counts. Um, now, that's, uh, I think, an interesting insight into uh, where uh, Quiglin's talk is actually going. Um, but if we get back to uh, where we were up to with this, um, Right. 
so I think uh, where did we get to? I've forgotten now. Yeah, he was as well as the comment of those clip with the comment of the clip friend. Right. To internalise its negative externalities and come into scale with the global commons, the economy will need to be redesigned as a subsistence of the biosphere, not simply as a metaphor or ideal, but as a structured principle. Before much longer, world society will have to adjust its economic exchange flows across political territorial boundaries of consumption, production and income to the resource thresholds of planetary boundaries or inflows of raw materials and energy and outflows of wastes. But why even bring this up to this group? What impact can finance possibly have on the monetary system? Why should we even care about the direction of the monetary system? Let's take a moment and situate ourselves in the big society. To reduce debt and pay for present public expenditures, government is selling off the social infrastructure that was originally created through taxpayers' money. In other words, the private sector is purchasing public assets and utilities that were originally funded by taxpayers, then turning around and selling these services back to us through private tolls and fees. This trend began in the 1980s and has increased dramatically since the recession of 2008. Everything is being privatised, swallowed up by the biggest fishes. Where does this leave the businesses, business and financial sectors? The ongoing creation of high leverage debt by banks and governments has plunged corporations into a turbulent financial spiral with its own self-perpetuating dynamics. As market demand slows in this age of austerity, there are slowdowns in bank credit, liquidity, employment, spending and investment, which lead to further decreases in demand. Based on current projections, companies will continue to face the uncertainties of access to capital markets, cash flow, capital investment, employment levels, discretionary spending and earnings forecasts well into the future. Corporations, like all segments of society, are rapidly recognising the limitations of strong state sovereignty and the need for a monetary system based on the long-range incentives of ecological energy and exchange rate stability. Businesses of every type, large, small and in between, are realising that indebtedness is a much greater threat to business than taxation. In the neoliberal era of Thatcher, Major, Bear, Brown, Cameron, this is the, a startling thought. The inexorable pace of our social and ecological debt raises important questions about the weaknesses inherent in current monetary institutions and policies. Tumult in global markets, the risks of inflation, deflation, leverage, frozen credit, private and public debt, sovereign default and volatile foreign exchange will continue to plague the economic system until a commons-based monetary structure and system of credit are created. Finance needs to realise that its interests lie in this new kind of monetary system, not in the debt-based version. The monetary troubles in Europe right now belie the same kinds of troubles that loom just ahead for the international monetary system, and yes, for Britain. The crisis of confidence that is upon us is rather simple. What actually are the bank's assets, and where are they? Just how far out of the line are these banks' assets from the money they are issuing? And shouldn't the world's monetary assets represent the commons? Finance stands to benefit from the creation of a global monetary union that provides deeper financial integration and, ex and also preserves international peace and security develop development, open markets, cultural and national identities and the world's natural and social commons. Well, this is what I've been building towards. Finance can actually lead the way in rethinking and transforming the monetary system by identifying, helping organise and investing in the global commons. That is where all of our interests converge for a sustainable future. Instead of trying to plug the holes in the leaky bucket of the debt-based economy, we can begin to build this new system alongside the old one. Indeed, if I may say, I think that what is, that is what Finance Lab is uniquely qualified to model. The commons are shared wealth, 
without which people cannot survive and thrive. This wealth is comprised of common goods, which have, we have inherited or created, are entitled to use and are obliged to restore and pass on to our children. These common goods, material, solar, natural, genetic, genetic, social, cultural, intellectual and digital, can be aggregated into a new kind of metric. This wide range of commons assets could constitute an index which is based not on productivity, profit or interest, but on the perpetual vitality and continuous adaptation of local resources to support a good quality of life for all human beings and life systems. Can we create this metric together? Commons trusts, including social charter initiatives, resource management groups, mutual credit systems, cooperatives, cooperative banks and credit unions are already reformulating the meaning of socially created wealth through co-structured rules and institutions. We need each commons trust to determine a resource differential rate which compares how much of its resource to use in the present with how much to set aside for the future. Trustees then put a cap on the maximum extraction and use of this particular com commons. Protecting a significant portion of the resources for coming generations. These caps indicate how much the withdrawal rate of depletable resources must be slowed to allow stocks to catch up with flows. For example, limits on resource use may be set on air and quality, water quality, ecosystems, health and biological diversity living creatures, organs and seeds, and minerals, water and the atmosphere. Similar indicators can be developed for replenishable resources including indigenous wisdom, household work and the arts, health, literacy, economic output and income distribution and scientific knowledge, intellectual property and information flows. Can we create the indicators to assess or assist these commons trusts? Common trusts are the only legal and fiduciary institutions whose primary goal is to preserve and replenish commons for future generations according to non-monetized metrics such as sustainability, quality of life and well-being. In turn, the needs of the present generation are met through a new relationship between businesses, commons trusts and governments as suggested by economists Henry George and Peter Barnes. Private industry provides the public with goods and services which are produced from the surplus resources rented from commons trusts. Government then recycles these rents as social dividends for the public and as funds for the preservation and regeneration of the commons through the trusts. In this way, world society can develop a dynamic equi equilibrium between private property rights, public sovereign rights and common sustainability rights through a new multilateral system. Can we set up the mechanisms to fund these commons trusts? The social finance sector and innovative institutional paradigms are becoming more deeply connected with our fundamental desire to support life our health and the health of the planet. With the proliferation of open source platforms and models that are highly collaborative, communities are engaging on projects in a deeper and more powerful way. Using the internet, social media and micropayment techniques, peer funding is bypassing banks and extending loans directly to businesses and individuals cutting out the complex infrastructure and branch networks that underpin, uh, underpin more traditional lenders. Peer funding has already become a prototype of a new division of labour between producers and consumers. Resource users are getting involved in the process of producing their own resources, thereby generating new forms of value, cooperation and trusteeship. This is demonstrating that the commons are not just resources, but the set of relationships they create, including the communities that use them and the cultural and social practices and property regimes that manage them. Imagine peer funding enabling producers and consumers 
to network and pool resources, creating projects that traditional finance and institutional channels won't tr touch, such as Commons Trust. Can we help Commons Trust attain this kind of funding? Instead of financing business, Commonwealth funds could be invested in the operation of the trusts which rent Commons resources to businesses. Through these new political accountability structures, citizen financiers will be making direct decisions on each common property of significance, holding and managing this resource for future and existing generations and species. There are thousands upon thousands of resources across the world that could benefit from the management and production of trusts. The opportunities for financing commons trusts are enormous. Look around. In many places across the world, people who share particular resources, including users, managers, producers and providers, are already managing them through unique forms of self-governance and collaboration. Whether these commons are traditional, rivers, forests, indigenous cultures, or emerging solar energy, intellectual property, internet, many communities are taking collective action to preserve their local resources, both for themselves and for future generations. These local trusts would greatly benefit from commons wealth funds. And just as smaller resource communities have learned to manage their assets successfully, the world's regional and international communities must also preserve their trans-border commons and thereby pay back modern societies huge debts to the environment, the poor and future generations. As in local commons, new management of the global commons will mean that resource extraction, production and consumption are limited to levels that do not exceed their carrying capacity. Transborder Commons Wealth Funds could be invested in the trusts that are created to govern many kinds of transborder commons, including um, carbon emissions, international investment, foreign exchange transactions, international trade, international airline tickets, maritime freight transport, ocean fishing, seabed mining, offshore oil and gas, international oil trading, satellite parking spaces, electromagnetic spectrum use, internet, information flows, toxic wastes, wastes, energy consumption. In coming years, the recovery of our suppressed commons as a source of participative governance and non-monetized value will become critical as the private and public sectors search a way out of the current global economic, energy and ecological crisis or crisis ease. Central banks and private banks are not going to be the ones to redefine the meaning of wealth. That will be up to the finance industry and its capacity to reformulate existing monetary models. The commons offer a range of resources which could generate a unique measure of mutual wealth and well-being that is based not on productivity, profit or interest, but directly on the sustainability and resilience of the global commons, on the perpetual vitality and continuous adoption of local reserves to support people's natural and social quality of life, and that of future generations. Imagine a world where long-term wealth arises not through consumer demand, investment or capital accumulation, but in the enhancement of the carrying capacity of the global commons to support life and life systems for present and future generations. And this commons reserve system would provide business and finance with what we are presently seeking. Long-term signals and incentives that arise through ecological energy and exchange rate stability. Now is the time to manifest plenty in our world to manifest the processes needed to ensure that there is that it is used wisely and sustainably so that everyone will get their needs met today tomorrow and hundreds of years into the future to do this to incorporate the economic system as a component part of society 
and society as a component part of the biosphere, we're going to need to treat money as a monetary ecosystem with the commons as our reserve assets. The commons must be created and sustained for the benefit of everyone in society. Can we create commons wealth funds that demonstrate our collective intentions for sustainability? That's what I hope we can discuss in any case when you go home and someone asks you what exactly is the commons. Now you can tell them the commons is the finance of replenishment. I like that, the, the finance of replenishment. So I think there's a tremendous amount of that uh, or in that for people interested in the blockchain, smart contracts, uh, distributed network ledgers, um, all of those um, management tasks and uh, systems, governance uh, points are very well suited to um, the trustless uh, governance models offered by smart contracts. Um, if you're not familiar with those already, um, you'll find other things on the blog, on my blog here, which, which will sort of point you in, in the right direction. Um, so, right, I'm going to just let this process and see if I can get this video off the uh, internet.